from the field to the film room to the war room. We've got you covered every step of the way as the road to the draft starts right now on BGN Radio. Hello and welcome to another episode of the BGN Draft Show. I am your host Shane Half and you can follow me on Twitter at Shane Half NFL. I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow draft enthusiast Dives. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mr. Crockpot. Be sure to check out his podcast, Party on Broad, all of his draft content on the BGN YouTube page. Dibes, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Talking about a great group of prospects today. All 10 guys we'll be talking about maybe could be drafted in the first round. There's, it is loaded, uh, so it'll be fun to talk about this. Yeah, it is a deep, deep offensive line draft, and we're going to break it all down. Also joined by my co-host on Chalk Talk, Mark Henry Jr., Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Henry Jr. underscore. Be sure to check out his Tough Cover radio show every Saturday. Mark, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. And yeah, I mean, this is a pretty historically good uh, offensive line draft class. So normally I'd say, oh man, offensive line, it's not as fun to cover. But man, this year with the monsters that we're covering, some of the some of the behemoths, some of the incredible athletes at the offensive line position, uh, there, there's a lot to like, and uh, I think Eagles fans, whether we like it or not, probably need to learn some of these names. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. We are doing our top 10 offensive linemen. We're combining offensive tackle and interior offensive linemen because sometimes there's some shifting between those positions. We'll tell you where we think these guys fit in, uh, and, and we'll move through it as quickly as possible here. So don't let it out. The prospect of an hour of offensive lineman talk scare you away. Uh, this is our, after this, we've only got a few position groups left. We'll have wide receivers next week. Uh, and then we also have defensive backs and tight ends. And that will wrap up our coverage at, at all the major position groups. So if you've missed any of those, you can go back and check them out, but we're going to dive in here. We're going to go with the guy that is our unanimous. Number one, it is Joe alt out of Notre Dame. Uh, now, under normal circumstances, I would let Mark talk about the Notre Dame guy first. Uh, but Mark was the highest on like seven out of the 10 guys here, the way it worked out. And I was like the only the highest on one guy. So I'm taking Joe Alt from Mark and I'm going to talk about him. Uh, Joe Alt was a four star recruit. Uh, he played tight end and defensive end in high school. He also played basketball and he actually didn't move to the offensive line until he got to Notre Dame. Uh, he gained 70 pounds between his junior year of high school and his freshman year of college. Uh, his father was a 13-year starter and a two-time pro bowler at left tackle in the NFL. His brother plays professional hockey in Germany. This is an athletic family. And Joe Alt's no exception. He is 6'8 and 5 eighths of an inch, which is 98th percentile uh, height for an offensive tackle. He's 321 pounds, which is 71st percentile. He had an 87th percentile 40-yard dash, 88th percentile broad jump, and a 94th percentile three-cone. Uh, all in all, that is a 9.91 relative athletic score, basically saying he is in the 99th percentile of athleticism among offensive tackles ever. Uh, he was a first-team All-American in both 2022 and 2023. He played 2,170, or excuse me, 2,178 snaps in his three-year career. All of them were at left tackle. In those snaps, he allowed only three sacks and 17 pressures, which is a 0.3% sack rate, a 1.7% pressure rate. He also only committed four penalties in his whole collegiate career. And in 2023, he was PFF's top-graded offensive lineman overall. I mean... You just watch this guy. If 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 you want to learn to evaluate offensive linemen, watch Joe Alt, and if he does it, it's good. I mean, he's got teach tape on nearly everything. Uh, he's huge, excellent athlete, great body control. He's light on his feet. Uh, he's a true technician at the position. Great footwork, great hand placement, high IQ. Uh, his eyes are always searching for work and pass rush games because – a lot of times with a stud guy like this, they'll try to scheme it up where you're just not blocking anybody. And he's always looking for work. He's a fantastic run blocker. He can get to the second level. Um, you know, if you're going to nitpick weaknesses for him, maybe he gives up a little bit too much ground sometimes against bull rushes before he anchors, but he does anchor. Uh, maybe he doesn't get as much pop into his run blocks as you would like. 
Uh, but overall, this guy is a surefire top five pick. Uh, he is a blue chip player for me. Uh, scheme diverse. Any any team would be happy to have this guy as a left tackle. So, Mark, what did I miss about your boy? No, you you hit the nail on the head for sure. I I'm su- I'm surprised that I'm not saying Joe Walsh should be a top five pick. Um, he actually checked in at number ten overall for me um, when I did my big board. I think that has a lot more to do with just how much top end talent is in this class, but he is my offensive line one in this class and has been, you know, basically since I've been covering this draft at the start of last year, I think that there were times this year that I felt like he wasn't quite as good as he was in 2022. Um, And PFF agrees. He was, you know, 91.4 PFF grade in 2022, as opposed to a 90.7. So he really fell off the cliff there. Um, no, I'm joking. He was still the highest graded, as Shane said, in 2023. But I think I was being fooled a little bit. He, he was trying to cover up some deficiencies on that offensive line. This was probably the worst offensive line he played on at Notre Dame out of the last couple years. And, and I think at times he was trying to cover some things up uh, to, to cover up for guys who weren't quite as good. But he still only allowed two hurries on the year. Um, he was a three-year starter at left tackle. You can install him as your left tackle. At, at the next level for the next 10 years and you could feel incredibly comfortable about it he's surprisingly quick uh, on his feet for being as huge as he is um but then i get i i guess the the turn on that is he's surprisingly not as just jacked and strong as you'd expect for for a guy who's as big as he is there's a couple other guys in the class who are as big as him or slightly slightly smaller than him who are just a lot more jacked but as shane says it doesn't really make a difference. He anchors really well. He after even if you want to nitpick how he handles a bull rush, he it doesn't really. I mean, I you know one sack out of the last two years, only four quarterback hits out of the last two years. I think that says it all. Yeah, he is one of three blue chip players that I have right now in the draft. Wow. Okay. Wow. So I uh, but I have I I I have not officially decided whether I'm going to have Brock Bowers as a blue chip guy or not. So. Uh, but he's up there for me, for sure. Uh, Dibes, anything you want to mention about him before I f- we go on to number two? No, um, just worth noting that I actually had uh, Olu Fashinu, uh number one and Joe Alt number two prior to the combine. And that injury to Fashinu was disappointing. I was hoping to see him uh, test uh, during the combine, but Joe Alt's numbers are crazy per next-gen stats. Uh, the dude ran like 14.14 miles per hour within the first five yards of his 40 yard dash. The, the best mark of any offensive lineman over the last two years at six foot eight is just obnoxious. It's just obnoxious. Um, <laughs> I, but anyway, Olu Fashnu, uh, great prospect, man. One of the smoothest movers we've seen in pass protection. Uh, Tyron Smith, Joe Thomas esque. That's how good this guy is. Um, more of a pass protector than a run blocker, um, but he's kind of everything you want in a modern NFL offense because of how well he pass protects. Um, His tape is really good. Uh, He's got really flexible hips, uh, very bendable knees. Uh, He does a really good job of dropping his hips into blocks. Uh, This is is an elite athlete, an extremely high ceiling, high football IQ. Um, Kudos to him because he would have been a top pick in 2023 but he decided to stay at penn state to further his education uh respect that but that's obviously a risky move and he stayed healthy (laughs) until the combine uh but uh here we are Uh, he's going to be a top 10 selection uh without a doubt um this guy has all the physical tools you could ever ask for an offensive tackle i think he's got the ceiling of an all pro left tackle in the nfl Um, and you look at the length, you look at the athleticism, you know, there, there's definitely more consistency with his hands and in the run game you'd like to see. Uh, but we look at like the ceiling of this guy, the floor of this guy, just a plug and play great player, top to bottom. That's Olu Fashinu. Can I tell you my favorite factoid about him? Sure. His hands are smaller than Kenny Pickett's. (laughs) Zero percentile hand size. I just thought that I, when I saw that, I went to go look it up. Yeah, he had eight and a half inch hands. 
uh, which is just objectively hilarious for a 6'6", 312 pound offensive tackle to have Kenny Pickett hands. I just thought that was really funny. So and using I- that, I, I'm curious, what do you guys think matters more in terms of your hand size, pass blocking or run blocking? What do you think that affects more? I would say run blocking because yeah. you got a grip. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah. There's a lot more and grabbing like and holding and advancing forward and run blocking. A lot more leverage than there is in pass blocking. I I wonder if that's part of why he's not quite as good of a run blocker. To, to be I would honest. assume it is. Yeah. Yeah. That ma- that that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm glad that's a factoid. I'm I'm better off knowing. So so thanks to Shane over there. You it's an interesting note too because like we hear every single year about how. You know the you know the the arm length of all of these mm-hmm. offensive linemen, and how a lot of these guys that we'll be talking about tonight are probably moving uh, on the inside. Never hear about uh, hand size. Never hear about hand size. Yeah, I mean, I think it's generally a lot less important than arm length, yeah. Uh, for yeah. sure. But I did just think that was funny when I see somebody's zeroth percentile in something, I have to go double check it, and it turns out it's accurate for Fashanu. Hmm. Yeah, I mean. Fashanu, it sound. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like he didn't do well at the combine. He nine four nine RAS there at the combine. He he did really well. Still, he just didn't do quite as well as Joe Alt did. Um, he played a thousand less snaps than all, and had some of the run blocking issues. I think he's just as good of a pass blocker um, as all. He's never allowed a sack. Uh, he only he allowed sixteen hurries in twenty four games over three years, um, which is uh, a, a little bit more than Alt, but. You watch the tape, and he is a, an incredible pass blocker. So, like Dive said, modern NFL, that's gonna that's gonna find a home. Yeah. All right. Well, that is our number one and number two, which was unanimous. Now we're gonna get to our number threes. And uh, Mark, your number three, he comes in at number seven for me, number five for Dives. Uh, it is Talisi Fuega out of Oregon State. So, talk to me about your guy. To be honest, uh, I really thought that this was kind of a consensus O-line three. And then I feel like over the last couple days and weeks, it hasn't been. I feel like earlier on in the process, everyone was kind of stacking these guys up one, two, three. And now everyone's got way different lists. And it's just interesting because Fogg killed the combine, not 9.44 RAS. Maybe I was just misinterpreting uh, kind of what the consensus was a couple weeks uh, weeks ago at the time. But I, I'm really, really in on Fuaga. I, I think he's a top 12 at, prospect on, on my board. Um, six five and a half, three twenty four, uh, thirty three inch arms. Not exactly what you want. Probably the, I believe the shortest of anyone in my top ten. Uh, without double or any tackle in my top ten, excluding an interior offensive lineman. Um, two year starter at right tackle, so he is probably a right tackle, probably not a left tackle at the next level. Some people think he might have to move into the interior. I don't see why. Uh, I think he is perfectly fine sticking at right tackle for the next ten years if you draft him. Um, he's he's allowed zero sacks over the last two years, only five quarterback hits, 18 quarterback hurries. He had an 88.2 PFF grade this year in 2023. 716 pass blocking snaps without a sack is is pretty impressive, I'd say. Um, and for for having said that, for that, you know, for how good he is as a pass blocker, he was a much, much, much better run blocker. Uh, and that was what Oregon State scheme is. It's a zone blocking, very run heavy scheme. Jonathan Smith, who just got hired um, by Michigan State, will probably be taking that there with him. Um, it's a big trademark of his. But he had an 80.0 pass blocking grade with PFF, but he had a 90.9 run blocking grade. He's got incredible balance. He has multiple clips, sending people flying off their feet in the second level. Um, I, I just think this guy, th- this guy is a really really good player on the outside. I don't see why. I I think sometimes people get obsessed with some of these metrics and say, oh, well, he's not going to be a tackle. He's going to move inside. Six, five and a half, 324. Um, I I know that the arm length's 33, but uh, I think he's a tackle. I I think people are overthinking it. Yeah, I put down that he could potentially kick inside to guard, but I don't think you draft him with that being your number one plan. Unless you're a team like the Eagles that's obsessed with 
drafting, yeah. you know, a replacement for an offensive lineman several years before they retire. In which case Ooh. I could see this being a guy the Eagles would love to draft to put it right guard and then move him out to right tackle at when Lane Johnson retires. But um, they just did that with Cam. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, but for, yeah, as far as what you do, if you're a team that's drafting this guy to play right now, I think it's at right tackle and you know, you just have in the back on the back burner, maybe the arms turn into a problem and maybe we kick him inside, but you definitely want to try these guys outside first. And, and something I'll say just a note, because I, for, for some reason, weirdly, I, I feel like Shane for, I feel like Shane, I always see in, in debates or talking on Twitter with bears fans. I don't know what I, what it is, but I feel like a bizarre percentage of my followers are bears fans on Twitter. So I see, and I follow some of them. So I see just a lot of bears fans talking about this draft. And I, and I thought this was interesting. Someone retweeted this from a, a bears writer and said, the bears sent all their top brass to the Oregon state pro day on the day that they just traded for their number two receiver. Um, I, I think that there's a good chance. Taliesi Flaga is off the board at nine to Chicago. Interesting. All right. Well, that would definitely prevent the Eagles from selecting him to play right guard. Yeah, yeah, that would. <laughs> All right, well, that is Talisi Fuaga. Mark's number three. Dives has him at five. I have him at seven. Let's talk about the guy that Dives and I have at number three, and it is J.C. Latham uh, out of Alabama. He was a five-star recruit in high school. Uh, he actually played defensive end his first two years of high school football. Uh, he is 6'6", uh, 342 pounds, which is 95th percentile weight. We talked about short arms. He's got 82nd percentile arm length. Uh, he played a little bit of right guard as a freshman, and then he became a two-year starter at right tackle. In 869 pass blocking snaps over the last two years, he allowed one sack, which is a 0.1% sack rate, and 20 pressures, which is a 2.3% pressure rate, uh, while committing 17 penalties. He was a second-team All-American and a first-team All-Conference in 2023. I think when you see Latham, the first thing that really jumps out is the strength that he has. Like there's a lot of power packed into his frame, uh, but he's also got, he's got an impressive blend of like coordination and agility for a guy that's almost 350 pounds. He's got really good hand placement and strength to lock down edge defenders. Um, I feel like once he, once he locks onto an edge rusher, he's almost able to just like twist them and take all of their power away. So tremendous strength. Uh, he generates a lot of displacement in the running game as well. Now, he does have a tendency on run blocks to sort of drop his head, and that causes him to lose vision on defenders, and that can be exploited at times by more slippery guys. Now, he can also get caught out by pass rushers with hesitation or inside counter moves uh, and end up out of position. Like I feel like he rushes to make contact because he knows once he engages, it's over. And sometimes he gets a little lungy there, but uh, I think this is a guy that should go, you know, mid first round, mid to early first round. I think JC Latham is a really good prospect uh, for the offensive line here. Now dives. He's also your number three. What did I miss on Latham? We did a mock draft where it was themed. And I, my, my mission was to make the most Howie Eagles mock I could. And the, the Eagles traded up to like pick number 13 with Terry and Arnold and Quinion Mitchell still available. And it wasn't any of them. It was JC Latham. I think he's the premier right tackle in this draft. Uh, I, I He's got more positives than negatives as a prospect, but pound for pound, just a terrific athlete. Alabama. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love JC Latham. All right, and J.C. Latham was number six uh, on Mark's board. Mark, do you have any J.C. Latham slander for us? Yeah, it, it's just I, I feel like he's solid, if not unspectacular, maybe. I, I think there's just a, a lot of solid to him. I don't think he's an elite pass blocker. I don't think he's an elite run blocker. I think he's pretty good at both. Yeah. Um, but, but to be honest, my biggest problem with Latham and just kind of a tiebreaker – I watched Alabama more than any other team. So if anything, that's going to be a negative for an offensive lineman almost, uh, I, I'd say. Um, besides Notre Dame, I, you just naturally, you'll watch almost every important Alabama game. 
same with, you know, LSU, some of the other top teams up there. And you watch some of how he played against the best teams. I thought he really struggled uh, against Michigan in, in the playoff. He only had a 66.9 PFF grade in that game. He really struggled against Harold Perkins in LSU, 61.3 PFF grade, uh, grade in that game. Uh, against Texas, who has a bunch of D linemen in the draft this year and will next year. He had a 64 PFF grade in that game. So um, I just felt like in a couple games that I watched this year, I did notice like, oh, not a great rep from Latham there. Because Latham was a name I knew all year because kind of going into the year, we knew he was going to be a top 10 to 15 pick. And if anything, I kind of walked out just a, a little bit underwhelmed compared to some of the other top tackles. Mm. All right. Well, let's keep it rolling along here. Uh, and we're going to go to Dibes number four. He's also my number four. He's number five for Mark. Uh, Dibes, talk to me about Jackson Powers Johnson. Oh, man. Um, you know, if, if you're a team in need of a long term starter at center or guard, Jackson Powers Johnson is that dude. Uh, just a quick twitch, explosive, powerful run blocker, uh, can thrive in both gap and zone concepts his versatility is as elite as it gets man um his run blocking is wildly impressive um he consistently creates a push at the point of attack um he's able to get out in space and land blocks um he, this guy as a prospect when it comes to weaknesses um he's one of the more flawless interior o linemen in this draft and that's why i have him so high um, at the combine, he had a 32 inch vert. Uh, that was 15th among 53 offensive linemen. Not great, uh, but he did have uh, 30 reps of the bench press at 225 pounds. That was tied for fourth among 28 offensive linemen to lift. Um, I think this is just one of the more eye popping players um, in this draft, like pound for pound. Uh, for the for all the same reasons why I was so high on Peter Skaronsky last year, um, I just think he's got loads of talent. Um, I think he's got one of the highest floors of any prospect in this draft. I honestly think he's a serious target for the Eagles at 22. Just a plug and play right guard for the foreseeable future. What's more important than keeping Jalen Hurts healthy? Jackson Powers Johnson was dominant at the Senior Bowl was dominant at the combine. Um, and he's, I mean, there was a time when we were probably thinking maybe like back in around one, top of round two, this guy's like probably mid first round at this point. And he's a, a name that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, I think there's a really good chance he stays in the Pacific Northwest and goes 16th to Seattle. Yeah. Um, Seattle's in, in some need on the interior line at center and guard. Um, so I've seen a lot of people connecting the dots there. Uh, but yeah, I, this is a guy you could really easily convince me to have him number four. There's basically he's right next to my guy who's number four in my overall ranks. Um, and he's the only offensive lineman who I'd be fine with the Eagles taking at, at 22, to be quite honest. I don't want to take a tackle at 22 who's not going to play this year. If you're going to take someone, they need to make an impact this season. And I think Jackson Powers Johnson would. And I think he would immediately be an above average starter wherever you wanted to put him, whether that be center or right guard. I imagine it would probably be right guard with the Eagles. But um, I, I think out of everyone we're talking about, I think this is the most likely Eagle uh, so, so far. All right. Yeah, I'm also very high on Jackson Powers Johnson, but Dives covered it really well. I really don't have a lot to add there. Uh, other than he was a backup right guard for Oregon for two years before he switched to center. So it's not just a out of the blue. Oh, we could play guard because it's what the Eagles need. He was their backup right guard for a couple of years. He dominated there at the senior bowl. So I think it's, it's an easy jump to put him at either guard spot. Uh, for yeah. a team that wanted him. And he played 350 snaps there um, in 2022. So that's a pretty good amount of snaps. And he's yeah. turning 21 on draft night. So <laughs> he's a young guy, uh, just a plug and play, potential all pro interior O lineman for a long time. And Shane will tell you because he's nailed a couple of them. Interior O linemen, when they pop, can pop right away to the point of being all pro level. I mean, we've seen it with Creed Humphrey. Uh, mm -hmm. Trey Smith, we've seen it a couple times uh, with interior linemen. Two guys in the same draft that I loved, <laughs> and they both ended up on the Chiefs. 
But all right, well, let's keep it rolling along here. Let's go to Mark's number four. He's number five for me, number 10 for Dibes. It is Amarius Mims out of Georgia. Mark, the floor is yours. You guys know I have a type when it comes to the trenches. <laughs> And this guy is just an absolute monster. I mean, six, seven and a half, 340 moves incredibly well. Nine and a half RAS, uh, 36 arm length, which is just, I mean, that's preposterous. That shouldn't be allowed um, in, in the NFL. His top RAS comp is Andrew Whitworth, but Mims has like two and a half inch longer arms. And Andrew Whitworth was a guy who like dominated with size. Like it, it's just pretty crazy to see a guy who's just this big and moves so well. He didn't start many games, but he's a first round lock, which I think shows how incredible the traits are. Um, an 81.2 pass blocking grade, 68.4 run blocking grade, just freakishly long arms, freakishly big hands. I don't know, Shane, if you have the, the measurement for his hands, I saw it earlier and it's absurd. Uh, but just freakishly big hands and he's bigger than you and he knows it. And that's how he plays. Uh, it uses his size to his advantage, annihilates defenders at the second level. He's a little shaky in the run game. Uh, I'd say occasionally plays a bit too high there. I, I think part of that too, is just that we haven't seen him have enough reps to, to work some of those kinks out and work some of those issues out. Um, I just wish he played more, but he did play a lot as a reserve before starting. Um, saw action as a reserve offensive tackle in 14 of 15 games in 2022. Uh, the spider chart looks like Pac-Man. Yeah. <laughs> Not a great vertical jump um, from Amarius Vance, but I don't think you'll be asking him to, to dunk a basketball anytime soon anyway. But uh, yeah, the, the rest of the spider chart, pretty, pretty incredible, incredible stuff. But he, he, he a lot of, a lot of snaps at reserve offensive tackle. He started, uh, the 2022 Peach Bowl and National Championship against TCU uh, played at right tackle in seven games in 2023 before an ankle injury started in six of them. Didn't allow a sack or a quarterback hit across 402 pass block snaps in his three year college career, allowed only six pressures out of those. Uh, he only got, like I said, an 81.2 pass blocking grade from PFF. But when I watched, I kind of came away with this very similar to Fashanu. Um, or, or Fashino, I always pronounce that wrong, but I, I, I came away pretty similar because I think in the modern NFL, I think this guy's just such a good pass blocker. I, I think he's a better pass blocker than that PFF grade would tell you at 81.2. I was super, super impressed. I think he plays with a nasty mean streak. Um, and I, I think the tools are there for him to get better at run blocking kind of the same way I do with, with Fashano. So uh, I, I feel good about Mims and he's a guy who I'm probably going to end up being much higher on than consensus. He's a guy like if you were nobody's playing Madden and creating a player on the offensive line. But if you if you were like, this is the guy you would create, Um, you know, he's well, I showed the spider chart and you guys can look it up at mockdraftable.com If you guys are listening on audio platforms only, you can check out anybody's spider chart you want. But he's just ridiculous. The thing with him is his lack of experience across three years. He's played 638 snaps only started eight games. Uh, he had an ankle injury this year that required surgery that kept him out from week three to 11. And you do worry about a guy that's this big once you start having ankle and foot injuries. Because, uh, I mean, the human body is not really meant to be 340 pounds. So uh, that's a concern for him. So the lack of an experience in medical red flags is, is why I have him down my board a little bit. He's raw, sky high ceiling, but it could take him a bit to get there. And that's if he can stay healthy. There was rumors that the Steelers, uh, I, I feel like my my role is apparently just to name where guys could go, apparently. But uh, I, I've seen some rumors that Amarius Mims could go to Pittsburgh um, at 20, I, I believe. I, I think that's where Pittsburgh is at number 20. But uh, apparently Mike Tomlin was at Georgia, and there was a funny picture of him like looking in awe at Amarius Mims and how huge he was. So uh, they just drafted Broderick Jones last year. Maybe they'll pair up uh, the former Georgia tackle teammates. Can you imagine Amarius Mims and uh, oh shoot, what's the tight end's name that I loved last year that they drafted? Um, Darnell Washington. Dar Can you imagine those two guys next to each other trying to <laughs> trying to run block? That that's just that's a sight to see. With Broderick Jones on the or Broderick <laughs> on the other side. Am I saying that name? Am I, I Broderick Jones? That was who. Broderick. Was, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, I thought I was getting the last name wrong, but yeah, I, I mean with him on the other side too. Yeah, just. 
bull, bulldogs all over the place. Yeah. All right. It's kind of like the reverse Eagles, right? They get yeah. they get all the Georgia offensive play. Same state. The Eagles get all the Georgia defensive players. The Steelers get all the Georgia offensive players. So, <laughs> you know, if they if they ever have to combine, you know, heaven forbid there be another world war and we end up with the Steagles again, you can just basically have the University of Georgia as the entire team. <laughs> the Steagle dogs. So. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep it rolling here. Uh, next up, we're going to go to mine and Dibes number six. Dibes and I are spot on with a lot of these guys. Uh, this is a guy that is not in Mark's top 10, and it is Graham Barton out of Duke. And so I'm curious to hear from Mark after I get done here on this one, but I think I know what the issue will be. But uh, Barton was a three-star recruit. He's got 39 career starts. Uh, five were at center as a freshman, and the rest are all at left tackle. Uh, he is 6'5", 313 pounds with 29th percentile arm length, 14th percentile hand size if we're running these percentiles as an offensive guard and not a tackle, which is what I think he's going to be. Um, he In the last two years, he has allowed a combined four sacks and 21 pressures, which is a 0.6% sack rate, 2.9% pressure rate at left tackle. But he's smaller than you would generally want a left tackle to be. That's why I think he is going to kick inside. Uh, and this is a guy that I don't think it's a projection like Talisi Fuega. That's like he could move inside if he doesn't work out outside. Like I think whoever drafts Barton will be drafting him to play interior offensive line. I don't think there's any trying him outside. Um, but one of the things I love about Barton is he keeps a low center of gravity all throughout, which is easier to do when you're a smaller guy to be honest, but low center of gravity. He's got great strength and balance out of his stance and out of his kicks. He's got really good grip strength that he uses to steer defensive linemen out of run lanes, which will be really valuable on the interior. I just think he does a good job of out leveraging opponents. He's got elite speed and agility. Uh, he thrives on getting to the second level in the running game. So you can pull him as a guard. You can climb him to the second level. Um, now I will say he does have below average length, even for an interior offensive lineman. So that's something he'll have to overcome. He's also got poor timing when he fires his hands in pass protection, which is not as big of an issue if he's inside, but it is still an issue. Um, he also allowed a lot of inside pressure when he was on an Island blocking against an edge rusher, which again, won't happen a lot when you kick him inside. So I've got a first round grade on him. I think a lot of his weaknesses are eliminated entirely when you put him at guard. Uh, and so I think he's going to be a really good guard for somebody that's going to go in the late part of the first round. Dibes, what are your thoughts on Barton? Anything I missed there? No, just elite positional versatility. Like he can play everywhere, whether like he's, got again just like jackson powers johnson he's got a really high floor i don't know if he has all pro written all over him um but he is going to be a quality starter for a long time where or a, a depth piece for a long time uh, or a tackle if a team is in a pinch and they need to throw a tackle like um you know he's got great versatility there um and that's why i'm so high on him all right. Mark, is he lower for you simply because of the projection moving him inside and devaluing into your O-line a little? Or I uh, yeah, I just don't think he's a tackle. Um, I, I think he's an interior lineman and we it, we don't have the tape on it. So it's kind of just I, I don't feel right putting him next to like Jackson Powers Johnson, who I've seen be an absolutely elite interior lineman. So that's why it, with interior line, I am willing to kind of rank a guy higher and value a guy like a like a Landon Dickerson in the past like a, a Linda Lindenbaum at the past like Jackson Powers Johnson if I've seen just a lot of tape with them dominating at that position um, I'd rather do that than project on a guy moving inside when I thought that there were some issues with foot speed I think a lot of those issues will go away on the interior I think he probably will be a really good interior alignment he's a second rounder for me so it's not like I'm saying I dislike him he's number 11 he would be number 11 for me. And just for, for reference, my top 10 are all in my top 35. So it, it's a tough top 10 to crack. And I have nine in my top 28. Like it, it's just offensive line is incredibly, incredibly deep. I think most years, Graham Barton would probably be my number five or six 
ranked offensive lineman, but uh, he checked in at number 11. All right. Well, let's keep the ball rolling here and let's go to Tyler Guyton. Uh, Tyler Guyton is number seven on Dibes list. He comes in at number nine for me, number 10 for Mark. Uh, so Dibes, talk to me about Tyler Guyton. Surprised you're so low on him. You clearly hate Oklahoma football. I guess that's what it is. <laughs> All right. You know, it's uh, a love-hate relationship after the last two years. So, <laughs> All right. But yeah, this guy has a ton of tools, a ton of upside, great length for the position, six foot seven, uh, 34 inch arms um, that at what? 322 pounds ish. Um, and the way he moves is, is pretty impressive. Um, he moves like a great athlete. He's got solid knee bend. He's got quick feet and fluid hips, powerful blocker. Um, he has a, he plays with a really wide base. Um, negative wise, he, he's all about projection, kind of like a Marius Mims in, in some regard. Um, in four college seasons, two at TCU, two at Oklahoma, he played just over a thousand snaps in 27 games only started 15 of those 27 games. And I think he projects as a developmental tackle uh, with the potential to start early in his career. Um, and what you're banking on are those tools. You know, you're, you're banking on uh, those tools to translate into a st starting offensive tackle with length, with movement skills, with play strength uh, to be a winning uh, tackle at the next level. So Tyler Guyton, uh, if you love tools, this is your guy. Yeah, he was actually a three-star recruit as a defensive end. He didn't play offensive tackle until he got to college. And I think you can see that. Like, he's very unrefined. His footwork's kind of all over the place. His leverage is inconsistent in the running game. His, his hand strikes are inconsistent. Um, but it's all there. Like, big frame, a lot of athleticism. He's He is... Uh, Amarius Mims, if Amarius Mims was a little smaller and didn't get hurt so much, like, and he was not quite as athletic, but it's the same sort of idea that it's a tremendous athlete with a lot of upside, but there's a lot of downside too. He's he's a boomer bus guy uh, for little different reasons than Mims in terms of injury, but I think he's kind of a boomer bus guy. Yeah, I. So I have Guyton ranked because, as you guys know, if you're six seven, you're gonna get all my top ten. Um, no, that's not true, but I, I, I like bigger yeah. offensive tackles and I, I think it gives you a big leg up and he's got the long arms. So he's got everything I want just trait and tools wise to be, to be ranked there. I don't understand why Tyler Guyton is ranked 29th on PFF and is considered a, a first round pick and not to, give, not to give away a guy, not to, I, by the way, not to say that I probably only have him like 34th or 35th, but my point is. I don't understand how Patrick Paul is then 90th. Patrick Paul has all those same tool, all those same tools, all those same traits, and he was actually good at blocking people. So yeah. I, I, I that's where I get a little lost. Where same with Marius Mims. Marius Mims, maybe he didn't <clears throat> play as much as we'd hoped. He was much better than than Tyler Guyton was. If you're looking at the PFF grades, you're looking at kind of the production, the pressures, all that stuff. I mean, Tyler Guyton had a 55 uh, or a 60.5 uh, run block grade this year, uh, only 72.9 pass block grade. Uh, mm -hmm. Did allow the, the two sacks last year, nine hurries this year, uh, pretty bad PFF grades each year that he got time. Um, I, I'm just not, I, I watched the tape and I'm not blown away outside of just the, the raw traits and the tools. And I'm willing to bet on those raw traits and the tools and the athleticism, the frame, the long arms, everything. But not compared to some of the other guys in the class, like a Mims, like a Patrick Paul, like a, a and then some of the interior guys, and then Fountain, Fountain. New. There, there's just guys that I think have more on tape that you can point to and tangibly hold that also have awesome traits than Guyton. Yeah, I've got a I've got a second round grade, uh, early second round grade, but a second round Same. grade on Guyton. Yeah, so. same here. I, I don't want to make it sound like I hate him. Again, I have him 10th and I have an early second round grade on him. It's just more about the gap between him and a guy like Patrick Paul or even Jordan Morgan. So, some guys where I, I just I, I don't understand what the gap is. Yeah, I'll say yeah. now. I think it'll be first round. For sure. I agree. 
I think he will too. I think he's going first round. That's just higher than I have him. I, I don't think – do you guys think he can play in the NFL in 2024? No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. yeah. That, that's concerning. With, with the first round. <laughs> and that's why the Eagles are definitely going to draft him in the first oh. round. At 22. <laughs> now, this – like we just nailed on the actual pick that would drive me the most crazy out of any possible pick. Uh, I mean that <laughs> – that would drive me up a wall in the stream. If you want to see like a person lose their mind, Charlie Day style or Charlie Kelly style from It's Always Sunny on our draft stream this year, the Eagles let the Eagles turn into Tyler Guyton pick card at that pick 22. That'd be silly. <laughs> yeah. That'd be silly. They could trade up to 18 to get him. So, <laughs> all right. I'll stop. I'll stop giving Mark a hard time here. We'll move on oh. uh, to. The next guy on the, le- on the list is Troy Fountainu. Now, he is eighth on mine and dives list. He's seventh on Mark's list, but I'm going to talk about him first anyways because somehow I was only highest on like one guy in this whole show. So <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Uh, but uh, Troy Fountainu out of Washington, he's a four-star recruit. Uh, he is small, uh, third percentile height uh, at offensive tackle at least, 13th percentile hands. Uh, but he's an elite athlete, 91st percentile 40-yard dash, 90th percentile vertical, 91st percentile broad jump, and a 9.4 relative athletic score. Uh, He was PFF's 14th highest graded pass blocker this year. Uh, In his career, he played 100 snaps at left guard and then 1,731 snaps at left tackle. And over the last two years, they allowed a 0.2% sack rate and a 3% pressure rate. Uh, he was a third-team All-American this year and a first-team All-Pac-12 uh, selection. Uh, he's got elite athleticism. I mean, and you would hope so for a guy that's smaller, but that athleticism pops. Like, he is a weapon on the move in the run game. Uh, he specializes in hitting moving targets, uh, taking those guys entirely out of plays. He's got strong hands that control reps once he's able to latch on to defenders. You're not going to get out of his grasp very often. And he's, I mean, he's a tone setter on your offensive line. He's a hustle guy. He looks for somebody to hit when he's uncovered. He's never taking a playoff. Uh, He's a fun guy to watch. Now, he does, uh, similarly to some of these other guys I've talked about, he pushes to get hands on guys early. And sometimes it results in pass rushers setting him up with stutter moves. He wants to hit that knockout blow early. Again, this is a tone setter guy. Uh, He's prone to push pull moves. Uh, he is an older prospect at 23 and a half. And it's, I, I have serious doubts about him playing offensive tackle in the NFL. And so you get into, if you're going to draft a guard, just draft a guard. Right. And so these guys that are offensive tackles that didn't really play guard, but are probably guards in the league, they get into a tricky spot to evaluate sometimes. Uh, so you, because you have to involve projection there, right? Like if you need an offensive guard, are you going to draft Troy Fontenot? Are you just going to go draft Jackson Powers Johnson? Are you going to go draft Graham Barton, somebody that's a little more one-to-one fit? I realize Graham Barton actually didn't play guard, but uh, he, he's just he's played center. He's played a little more inside. And so I think that's the downside on Fontenot. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see where whomever drafts him starts him out. That, that's what I'm really interested to see, but I think he's a guard. I'm a bit more bullish on him as a tackle. I I think he could be a guard. I'm not, it's not like uh, I'm coming on here the way I did about Flaga, where I'm like, I think he's a tackle and people are trying to change him. I I think it's very possible. He's an interior offensive lineman. Just watching the tape. I'm willing to kind of, I'm willing to listen if, if he would, if he wanted to be a tackle and if the team wanted to make him a tackle, his 2022 was better than his 2023. Um, in, in terms of pass blocking at the tackle position, but I also don't want to. He gave up the two sacks and a couple uh, a couple quarterback hits, and more hurries this year. I don't want to let a couple bad reps ruin like two like a year and a half of tape. I guess where I, I felt like for the most part I walked away really impressed with him at tackle. Um, but the length is obviously a problem. Um, he's going to struggle with taller edge rushers. Although I don't think you can find a ton of instances of that on tape. Um, there's not, there's a few out there. Um, but I, I think he's a guy who just played against 
he really stepped up in the playoffs in big moments against really good defensive lines. I felt um, that the Washington offensive line ended up kept kept Penix pretty clean there. Um, but yeah, he I understand how some of the stuff I said about Barton could be hypocritical uh, with, with me having Fountainu at seven. Um, there's not much separating Fountainu from Barton in my actual rankings, just besides the fact that I'm a little bit more bullish on the fact that uh, I think he could potentially be a tackle, whereas Barton, I don't see it. All right. Dibes, anything you want to add there? He's a straight-up dog, man. He, mm-hmm. He's a dog. Like he's He plays with a mean streak. He was a fun, fun guy to watch. I watched a lot of Washington last year. And he's he's an animal, man. Like, uh, he, I I love how you uh, said. I think tone setter. That's a really good way to describe uh, Troy Fountainew. Um, and I do think he's a sneaky, underrated Eagles target um, with with a guy that could be a right guard and then you know play right tackle in a pinch if needed. Um, and I think Eagles fans would love him. The, just the that mean, nasty streak he brings to the football field. All right. Well, let's keep the ball rolling here. We're going to talk about a guy that is exclusive to Mark's board. Uh, His number eight guy. uh, Talk to us about Patrick Paul. So, yeah, you guys aren't big wrestling fans, um, but uh, there's a legendary wrestler named Big E, and he's a, he was a former Iowa offensive lineman, actually. Um, Big E Langston. He, He went to the WWE instead of going to the NFL. Um, and he's this huge guy and he talked about why he liked these big wrestlers as his favorite wrestlers. And he famously said big meaty men slapping meat. And that's become a very iconic wrestling uh, joke that, that fans talk about. And Patrick Paul is a big meaty man blocking big meaty men from getting to the quarterback. That's exactly what he is. He is a mountain of a human being. I mean, he is just – it's hard to – I talked about Amarius Mims having just freakishly long arms at 36 inches. Patrick Paul's even longer. I, I mean, just for, for reference there, six seven and a half, nine point eight 9.8 RAS. And this isn't a case, of, like I said, compared to Guyton, where Guyton has all those traits and all those tools. This isn't a case where I'm fully projecting. Patrick Paul is an incredible pass blocker. He posted a 91.5 pass blocking grade this year, according to PFF, 69.4 in the run blocking grade. Uh, very, I think he's one of the very best pass blockers in this class, has a nasty mean streak, and I think he plays with a chip on his shoulder, and he shows that in the run game, even if he is a bit inconsistent while blocking in the run game. Uh, only two sacks allowed over the last two years on just an absolute ton of offensive uh, of off, uh, pass, ru- pass rush snaps. Um, they absolutely passed the ball a ton there in the air raid, Dana Holgerson at Houston. Um, but he's got an NFL pedigree with his brother in the, in the league already he impressed at the senior bowl. He killed the combine, amazing footwork for a guy so big. He moved really well, uh, in the 40 and just in all the, uh, the drills in general. Um, he's a guy who uh, I think I- I'm just shocked with all of what that's happened in the process. You got so much glowing praise from the senior bowl. Killed the combine, 9.8 RAS. He's six, seven and a half. Why hasn't he risen up boards? I don't get it. I, I, I love Patrick Paul, and I've loved him since I started watching him early last year. All right. Dives, anything you want to add on Paul? You're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the same stuff as t- kind of Tyler Guyton. Like just you're, you're betting on that long-term developmental uh, toolsy type of prospect. Um, I think he's fantastic. I've got an early day two grade on him. Um, I, he's kind of in that same tier uh, of guys that um, I would not be shocked to see drafted round one. Um, that's that's really it. I think Mark, you nailed it. All right. Well, let's move on to a guy that I was sure I was going to be highest on. Uh, but he ended up as your number nine. He's my number 10. Uh, talk to me about Cooper BB out of Kansas state dives. Oh man. I'm really happy about this more. So I, I put him on this list because no one had him and I wanted to make sure he got repped uh, in this one, but reliable is the first word that comes to mind when you watch this guy. Um, he's one of the best blockers in college football. And he's been since 2022, 2023, like, 
among the best offensive linemen in college football. Uh, he's got amazing versatility, 26 starts at left tackle, 14 at left guard, eight at right tackle. He's got a handful of snaps at right guard um, and, you know, elite production all across the line. That four position versatility, man, that combined with his experience, his tremendous size, width, and mass, man. You're talking about – so when you, when you put that in a package with what he showed at the freaking combine, you get really excited. Uh, he had a 5-0-3-40 at the combine at 322 pounds. He had a 1-7-5 second 10-yard uh, split. Um, he's really climbing up the boards, and I don't think people talk about him enough. Um, another one of those high floor players, uh, that really can help you in so many different ways. You know, we know the Eagles love these verse kind of versatile linemen. Um, and Cooper BB truly fits that mold. He's, uh, he could instantly be a backup at both guard spots or a starter. He could possibly take some snaps at tackle if you need him to. Um, but Again, all signs point to this guy being a quality guard in the league for a long time. He's an underrated athlete, um, and I love him, man. He's he's one of the top guards, one of the top interior linemen in this draft. Yeah, I I feel like when you look at he's like you said, he's got tremendous versatility. He's played right tackle, left tackle, left guard, um, so he can play a lot of positions for you. He was the Big 12 Offensive Lineman of the Year each of the last two years. Um, really high IQ player. I think the the, neg the big negative is just his arms are really short, second percentile, and that shrinks his margin for error with punch timing and placement. And he doesn't have the best lateral mobility. Uh, but he's still, overall, he's got a 9.3 relative athletic score. This is a guy that I would love uh, to see the Eagles take at 50. I think he goes – I've got a – Second round grade on him. I would love to see him as a right guard of the future there for the Eagles. So uh, he's a player that I'm very high on, but apparently not high enough to get to cover him first on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I so. thought I'd be highest on him at O line 13 when we eventually got to our full <laughs> big boards, but uh, that, that wasn't the case. And I'll, I'll just log my, my complaining about PFF's rankings um, on their, on their draft simulator, as I do with all mock draft simulators, uh, I complain about dumb rankings. I'm a Notre Dame fan. Blake Fisher should not be ranked 45 spots higher than Cooper BB on any <laughs> overall draft board. That is a horrible job by PFF. I just wanted to throw that out there. That's funny. All right. Well, Mark, bring it home for us here. Uh, talk to me about your number nine. He's outside of both of our top tens, but this is the last guy. Talk to me about Jordan Morgan. Yeah, Jordan Morgan's just a, a really, really solid option, I, I think, at, at offensive tackle. Um, 6'5", 3'11", 9.0 RAS, 9.86. If you shift him to inside, as some people think he might, um, I'm a little bullish again on him as an offensive tackle in the same way that I am with Fountain, except I'm even more bullish with Morgan on staying on the outside, obviously a bit, a bit bigger, even if he does have even shorter arms, um, but he is six, five. Um, he was bad in 2021 as, as a, a really young player at Arizona, but he was excellent in both 2022 and 2023. Um, last year, he had an 87.3 pass blocking grade, a 77 run blocking grade. Um, you guys know I felt like every week I was talking about Arizona, whether it be a player I was covering or a game we were talking about. Um, I was definitely in tune to Arizona. He was playing left tackle there. They passed the ball an absolute ton as well. Um, he played really well against some of their best opponents, I felt like, throughout throughout the season. Um, really, really smooth. Uh, again, I, I just think everything on tape, and if you just didn't know that he had 32 0.75 inch arms. I don't think people would be nervous at all. And I think he'd be ranked higher. And I think we wouldn't even be talking about if he was an interior lineman, but I get it. The arms are short. All right. Well, there you have it. That is our top 10 offensive lineman to recap here. Uh, 
I have from one to ten Joe Alt, Olu Fashanu, JC Latham, Jackson Powers Johnson, Amarius Mims, Graham Barton, Talisi Fuega, Troy Fountainu, Tyler Guyton, and Cooper BB. Mark has Joe Alt number one, Olu Fashanu, Talisi Fuega, Amarius Mims, Jackson Powers Johnson, JC Latham, Troy Fountainu, Patrick Paul, Jordan Morgan, and Tyler Guyton. And Dibes goes Joe Alt, Olu Fashanu, J.C. Latham, Jackson Powers Johnson, Talisi Fuega, Graham Barton, Tyler Guyton, Troy Fountainu, Cooper Beebe, and Amarius Mims. So that is it. That is our top 10 offensive linemen. Uh, congratulations if you're still listening 55 minutes in and you want some honorable mentions. Uh, Dibes, honorable mention. You got anybody you want to talk about? Yeah, the guy I want to talk about is Zach Frazier. Uh, really fun interior offensive lineman, just a dog. Uh, I have, a, I guess, I have a type. <laughs> <laughs> I've been kind of, ha- I've had a theme here tonight. Um, but this guy has elite production. Um, he's a densely built center. Um, if it weren't for Jackson Powers Johnson, Graham Barton being elite at what they do, uh, we'd be talking a lot of, more about Zach Frazier. Um, excellent in the passing game. Um, he, he's got some inconsistent play, um, but I, I think this guy has starter level traits at the starter, at the center position. And he doesn't, I don't think he has that much versatility like a Jackson Powers Johnson or Graham Barton. He's going to be a center, um, which is not a knock. Uh, but yeah, Zach Frazier, I think round two, round three, someone's going to get a, a, a steal and he's going to be a quality player for a long time. All right. So there you have it. Zach Frazier out of West Virginia. Mark, do you have anybody you want to shout out or is 56 minutes good for you? (laughs) Frazier would have been my top shout out. If if I'm going to shout someone out, I'll I'll just be quick. Cedric Van Prant is a guy that I'm a Mm -hmm. lot higher on than consensus. Um, I have him uh, at OL 14. It's a guy who's just played an absolute, ton of snaps at Georgia at the highest level on the best, you know, offensive lines and the best teams against the best opponents. And he's not right. Like he's not ranked on day two. I I don't really get that. I think he's a guy who should be a a lock in the second round. Um, Hasn't given up a sack the last two years. He's only given up one quarterback hit the last two years. Uh, Pretty elite pass blocker on the interior. Maybe not an elite run blocker, but uh, maybe not an elite athlete and grayed out perfectly well. But I just think the experience at such a high level, uh, there's no way to me that he doesn't turn out to be an average, at least starting guard or center. All right. Well, there you guys have it. Uh, I throw one that more is, out. Sure. I'll throw throw it out there. What the um, heck? If the Eagles can get him like sometime day three, Zach Zinter out of Michigan, mm. um, uh, another interior O lineman, another dog. Um, high football IQ leader. Uh, make sure you keep an, an eye out for Zach Zinter. He's recovering from an injury. Uh, he should be ready to go, but he's going to fall because of that injury. And I'll throw another one out. Uh, <laughs> Dominic Pooney from Kansas. He might be an interior <laughs> lineman. I don't know how to say his name. Pooney, Pooney. I feel like it's not a great know. name for an offensive lineman. If <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. He's got to work on that. Maybe say it's like Panay, I, I don't know. He's got to come up with a, a better pronunciation for that. But six six guy is an absolute beast. Who's only allowed oh wait zero sacks over the last two years, playing two full years um, at, at left guard and then left tackle. He's he's you know multi versatile. I, I like him a lot. All right. Well, there you guys have it. Everything you could possibly need to know about <laughs> offensive linemen in this year's draft. Uh, bless you if you're st- if you listened all the way through you're a true sicko like we are when it comes to draft stuff uh so take this gold star uh for what it's worth but thank you guys for joining us for this episode of the bgn draft show uh if you enjoyed the show be sure you tune in next week we're going to be breaking down our top 10 wide receivers and it is another deep class the depth of this class offensive line and wide receivers so we're going to be doing top 10 there as well uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you get that show along with all of the other shows on the BGN radio feed. Uh, you can also check it out on YouTube if you want to see our cool graphics and things we throw up on the screen. Those are there as well. Uh, you can check us out on Twitter. I'm at Shane Half NFL. Dibes is at Mr. Crockpot. And Mark is at Mark Henry Jr. And we will catch you guys next week.
for another episode of the BGN Draft Show. Go Birds!